Hi, everyone. Sincere apologies for the technical difficulties, um, but I'm glad that we were able to get started tonight. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event for On the Job, which is a wonderful book by Jane Von Bergen and Celeste Monforten. And this event is co-sponsored by Seminary Co-op Bookstore, Arise Chicago, and The New Press. You can support Seminary, Seminary Co-op and the authors by buying a copy of On the Job directly from the bookstore using this link. And my name is Jay and I'll be running the tech for tonight, which admittedly I did not get off to a good start with. Um, so just a quick note that you can pose a question to the panelists by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I'm going to introduce the speakers. Celeste Montforden is director of the Beyond OSHA Project, a lecturer at Texas State University and a sought after national media commentator. Jane M. Von Bergen is an award-winning reporter who covered labor for more than half of her 35 years at the Philadelphia Inquirer. She and Celeste Monforten are co-authors of On the Job. Margarita Klein of Arise Chicago is the daughter of political refugees from Chile and has been dedicated to workers' rights and social justice for over two decades. With over 20 years experience in the workers' rights and labor movement, she has experience training teams of workers to create workplace demands, win union representation, and make concrete workplace improvements. She was, she's been named Labor Woman of the Year for the Chicago Federation of Labor, 100 of Chicago's most influential women, and has been profiled in the Chicago Tribune. We're also joined by uh, Shelley Rizicko, Communications and Devel Development Director for Arise Chicago. And I just wanna give a quick background on the organization as well. Arise Chicago builds partnerships between faith communities and workers to fight workplace injustice through education, organizing, and advocating for public policy changes. The Arise Chicago Worker Center is a membership-based community resource for workers, both immigrant and native-born, to learn about their rights and organize with fellow workers to improve workplace conditions. Since opening its doors in 2002, the Arise Chicago Worker Center has collaborated with nearly 50,000 workers to recover over $9 million in owed wages and compensation. ACWC's workplace justice campaigns train workers to know their rights, file complaints with government agencies, organize direct actions, and access legal representation. Arise Chicago has organized its members to win six laws at the city, county, and state levels, including creating the Chicago Office of Labor Standards. And with that, I'm going to pass the mic off to Celeste, who will be um, our moderator for tonight. Thank you so much, Jay, and to the New Press and Seminary Co-op and Arise Chicago for hosting this event. On behalf of Jane Von Bergen and I, we are really pleased to be able to talk with you and to engage with Margarita. Um, about worker centers. Uh, this project um, of developing the book really started in 2017. Um, and I personally just couldn't escape the political vitriol that was really magnified by President Trump. There was so much ugliness regarding immigrants. There were immigration raids, fear mongering, um, attacks on the Affordable Care Act. And I, I just couldn't escape the negativity. And on top of that, there was just a lot of rhetoric about workers not needing labor unions, workers not interested, the decline of labor unions. And there was this disconnect because at the same time, I was hearing these amazing stories of workers on the front lines in Houston and Austin and Chicago who were making demands of their individual employers, um, workers who would you know, organized so they could rent a bus and show up at a city hall and testify at city hall meetings. So uh, for me, that was a very positive, you know, that, that was positive news. And I wanted to capture all of that, um, all of that great activity and positivity. And these stories that I was hearing were really inspirational. So that's how that was kind of the impetus for the book. And um, I know that Jane and I just feel very hopeful when we learn these stories from the worker centers and it'll be a privilege um, talking particularly with Margarita about all the great work that's been going on at Arise Chicago. So um, Jane, I just wanted to ask you because you were the one that did the on the on the um, ground reporting in Chicago with Arise Chicago. What did you learn? Um, what do we include in the book about what we learned engaging with Arise Chicago. Well, Arise Chicago, 
all the all the aspects of Arise Chicago's organization just fit in everywhere in our book. It's almost like you could draw a line and and hang clothes on it because it was it was just constant. Is it was it about how, um, for example, the how unions fit in with worker centers, the definition, every, um, just every um, every single aspect, the, the domestic workers campaign that we wrote about a lot, Celeste, and that Margarita knows about so well, we'll talk about later. And uh, that's what I, I think what I found in Arise Chicago was sort of a basis to understand the worker centers across the, the United States. So anything that we learned, most everything that we learned in Chicago really helped us make sense of what we were seeing elsewhere. Yeah, I, I think of it as Chicago is like a character that goes throughout the whole book where we have the book organized where there are chapters um, on 11 different worker centers that we write about. And then we have some theme chapters. One is about the relationship between worker centers and faith and academic organizations. Um, we have a, a, a chapter on health and safety. We have a chapter on like how what are worker centers and how are they organized? But then, you know, also these individual chapters on the worker center. And we don't have a chapter on Arise Chicago because it comes up in so many other places in the book. The voice of um, Shelley Rizika, who's on the call of Adam Cater, um, of Magdalena. Um, and it, it's, it was, like I said, it's like a character in, in the book and we learned um, so much. So I want to ask Margarita, um, in terms of Arai Chicago, what does Arai Chicago mean in the Chicago community? Oh, oh I think you need to unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, first is, uh, you know, I would like to thank you for the opportunity, you know, of, of being, um, here uh, talking about something that I feel really passionate about it, which is our organization. Uh, in terms of the Latino community, Arai Chicago is, a, is a, you know, is the support system for them, uh, you know, in the workplace. And uh, particularly for uh, women, which is the majority of our members are, um, you know, Latino women. And uh, I think, uh, is, is, uh, it has been crucial for these workers who uh, in general feel that they have no power, they have no, um, they have no rights, you know, they, and knowing the organization, an, organi an organization that will support them, that will uh, develop them, you know, uh, provide them the tools to defend themselves in the workplace, to protect themselves and their co-workers in, in the workplace. Is, is, is really significant. And we have been able to see it fully in, in, during the pandemic, particularly during the pandemic. And uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, again, it has been crucial for them and in their lives. When, um, you know, Jane and I, we wanted to come up with, you know, a description of like when people say, what is a worker center? And, and Jane, you have a great way to describe it. Why don't you share that with us? Um, and and with by the everyone. way, I'm going to give a credit to Adam here because I, I kind of stole it a little bit from Adam Cater, who's the director of Arise Chicago and is a very thinking kind of person. Oh, everything has a bigger uh, whatever it is, it has a bigger um, implication for Adam. So in terms of the worker centers, you, you know, at the very minimal, the labor movement, when we talk about the labor movement, you can have two people in the office, they don't like their boss, they're complaining about their boss, and they uh, send and they call an upper manager. That's protected concerted action. And it is permitted under the national and in and protected a National Labor Enforcement Act. And then on the other end, you might be in Paris where the entire sub uh, city is shut, shut down because there's a strike of all the workers. And in between, we have what we think of traditionally as a labor movement, which is you know unions and 
typical union kind of thing that you read about all the time. But there's another portion of the labor movement, again, workers getting together to help each other uh, and gain power through a joint action, and that's a worker center. And these worker centers can help workers who, because of the nature of their employment, really uh, can't easily be unionized. I mean, you think about, for example, housekeepers, different employer every day, the, the guys, uh, the, the construction workers standing on the corner at home, um, at Home Depot, who's their employer, who's going to be on the other side of the collective bargaining table, uh, temp workers who one day they're with one agency working in one place, and the next day they're with another agency working in another place. These, all these kinds of workers um, need a way to build power, and, and worker centers have been an excellent conduit for that, but, but they are still part of the labor movement. Yeah, that was one of the things when I first started thinking about the book, I think of it in terms of like big U union, which is what people think of, you know, are you in a union? And when I worked with um, some coal miners in West Virginia, back when I worked at the labor department, you know, they weren't interested in being members of the United Mine Workers, but they were very interested in coming together and figuring out how to improve things on the job. They didn't totally buy into my um, you know, description of you are union, small you union. They never embraced that. But that's kind of what I think about, Jane, as you were describing this, you know, this range of, of the labor movement and the way work is organized now, um, you know, with gig workers and, and day laborers and housekeepers and all kinds of jobs that don't fit into what we think of kind of as traditional jobs, we need to think about labor organizing in a different way. And I think that's why it was so important for us to write this book, because it really is the untold story. Most people don't have never heard of a worker center. And we just thought it was really, really important to understand the great work that being, is being done around the country by organizations who are, who are made up of workers who are kind of seizing their power and making demands, not just for the bare minimum of what workers deserve and need, but demanding more, deserve, um, demanding more than um, people would expect from some of the most vulnerable workers in our country. I know that Arai Chicago and your allies have just had an amazing success on a campaign that you have worked on, Margarita, and, and your colleagues there and all the members with regard to um, domestic workers, housekeepers. And I'm hoping that you, I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to talk a little bit about that campaign and um, how it came about and what the result has been so far. Yeah, well, domestic workers, you know, it's a very uh, particular uh, category of worker that it was treated for many years as a, a, um, sub, a contractors. You know, you come to my house, you take care of, uh, you know, the elderly, you take care of my children, you clean my house. And then it's an agreement between, not even an agreement, it's a conversation between you and I. And, and you gave me a price and it doesn't matter if you spend 10 hours cleaning my house, you know, that is the price I'm going to pay you disregarding, you know, minimum wage and other working conditions. And uh, in, the, in the last few years, you know, it has been uh, uh, in, in the power of uh, Arise Chicago and other allies, you know, to uh, influence the politic in, in the state and, and then uh, at the end in the city of Chicago, uh, a significant change has been going on in the last few years. And the, and the most significant of all, it just happened in Chicago very recently. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's an ordinance called Cheese Beats. This ordinance called for domestic workers to be, uh, they are making the minimum wage of the city of Chicago, which is $15 an hour. That is, un, uh, is unhearable, you know. So, and, and, and it's not even the minimum minimum because the minimum way for, for a group of worker or, or a company that have 20, uh, 20 and less employees is $14 uh, an hour. But in this case for domestic workers, regardless if uh, they work for an agency or if uh, they work for uh, um, 
uh, or, or they clean different houses, one person is supposed to, uh, they have to get paid $15 an hour. And that, is, you know, getting into effect in, uh, in August this year. And, and the other, and even more significant than that is the fact that now employers in the city of Chicago uh, need to um, have a contract for, the, for these employees. So it's the ultimate recognition of these people to being an employee. They have to pay the, not just the minimum wage, but they, they get a buy, you know, for any, uh, um, it's protections for uh, wage theft, it's protection for, you know, the, the sick uh, leave that they have the right in the city of Chicago. And is the fact that now they can feel that they belong to a bigot group. That is not, they are getting out of isolation. They are not working alone in those houses. You know, there are protection out there. They are being recognized by the law as a full employees, and they have the right to negotiate as equal with their employer. I think it's, it's, it's fundamental. And, uh, and we are very, very proud. You, you have no idea the, the level of excitement, you know, that these workers have. And again, the majority of them being women and uh, coming, coming to the light. In fact, it, 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 our organization, uh, we have the honor of being selected to uh, run a pilot program. So one of the things that we, we are doing in order to implement is education. First of all, education. Yeah, we need to inform, uh, you know, the, these people that they do have the right to negotiate their contract, but not only the domestic worker, but also the employer, because they need to know that that, that is what, the, you know, the, the city of Chicago demands, that they... Uh, uh, negotiate these contracts. Uh, we we have um, seven seven of our members took a very lengthy course, uh, and, and they are contract a, a contract specialist. These people will provide direct help uh, assistance to uh, domestic workers who call them and uh, and they want to you know they, they evaluate or decide what. There is, uh, is the need in those contracts. So we are teaching them how ne a negotiation works, and that is general for everybody, open to the public. We say, you know what, there are three lists. What I really need is that, it, that I have to be in the contract, what is my, mm, I need, but I can live without it, and what I definitely am gonna put it, but I don't need. So those are your negotiations tools. You took the, the last two columns, but the first one, don't touch it. That is what you want in that contract, you know? So it's, it's massive, <laughs> it's massive. It's something that I used to do with union members. That was the training for our bargaining table. Wow. And now we are doing a massive bargaining table in the city of Chicago. So it's, it's really amazing. It's so real, Yeah, it's really, it's so exciting and it, it just tells you the power of workers coming together, understanding what their rights are, but also seeing what is it we really want to have good jobs and good well-being and care for our families and have you know successful communities. Um, what what really impresses me about the whole Chicago situation is what is something that I guess happened maybe a year ago when you were able to get the Office of Labor Management, because how this is great when when uh, your people when there's going to be a contract, but when 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 things go wrong, which they will do, how will that be enforced? And I think that that's a place where Arise Chicago has really been a leader in in pushing for enforcement measures. You know, you can have your your press conference, and we're and we reporters are all you know like you know favor of press conferences, but uh, how does the law have teeth? And, and so I think it's really awesome that um, Arise Chicago has been able to push for that office. And I was just wondering, how's it going? Has it been staffed up? It wasn't uh, initially under the new mayor, but what, what's happening with that now? It has been staffed up and, uh, the, you know, it's, it's fully functional, it's, it's implementing the program. It has been a great, uh, you know, the Office of uh, Labor Standard has been a great partner you know, to not just to our organization, but to other, uh, you know, community groups in enforcement. Uh, and uh, 
obviously, you know, we are always claiming for more, more power of enforcement, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, in, it's in progress. And, and the partnership, I think, is the most, uh, the most important thing. They are listening to us. We feel that, uh, you know, we have a voice. And, uh, and we have a huge ear that is, is listen to our, uh, listening to our voice and trying to address uh, our needs. And so then the other thing that's so impressive in Chicago, or I thought was so impressive, was the Raise the Floor initiative. I, I hope that's still going on. That, there, that's, that's like Uber, Uber collective ac action. Not only do you have the collective action of the individual worker centers, but then you have the collective action of all the worker centers working together teaming up for teaming up to um, to have something like a group lawyer, a group policy director. I think it was either Adam or Shelley that explained to me how this office, you know, say you're making a run on Springfield, um, Illinois, which is, the, you know, the capital. You guys from Chicago know that. But anyway, um, if you're making a bus run, well, who orders the bus? Who orders the lunches? Who decides who's going to go where? Instead of having each individual worker center tasked with that job and a million emails back and forth, big waste of time, you have a policy director to do it. And that's why Chicago is so interesting and, and innovative on the whole, you know, this whole worker center front. And I think other places are paying attention, taking note. That's one of the things, that's one of the that's one of the things that um, we discuss in the book, how worker centers kind of learn from each other. And that uh, we saw that experience, we have a chapter about the domestic, about domestic workers um, campaigns in different states, in, in different cities in different states. And what we saw is you would have, you know, I think the first one was in New York and you saw, you know, the nature of that campaign and what the workers won out of that campaign. And then another city tried something like that, but they tweaked it in a certain way, maybe asked for a little bit more. So I think there are eight or so states or, and cities that have domestic workers bill of rights. I know there was one um, adopted by the state of Illinois, and I'm just wondering how that led Margarita to, to the place you are now, because it sounds like you were building on what was, um, what was included in that domestic workers bill of rights, but probably what you learned still needed to be in place for for domestic workers. But definitely, and let me just go back, uh, uh, you know, a little bit about Rise the Floor. I think, you know, it, the, the importance of an organization like Rise the Floor is just to uh, have all these worker centers, you know, located in different uh, communities around the city of Chicago to become together and put together our power trying to, you know, to influence, you know, changes, uh, you know, uh, uh, in legislation, changes and uh, changes in, 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 you know, different policies in the city and in the, in the state. I think it's, it's the power of the many, you no? Know? If we work isolated, at the, at, at the end, you know, the, the, the whole purpose is, is the same purpose, is the protection of the workers and the, and the providing of the tools for them to defend themselves. Because that is the other important part, uh, and, and which ar arise, you know, is fundamental on it. Because it's not just, uh, you know, to help. When you help, you take the hands and you walk with people. In this case, you know, what we do, we don't just take hands. We provide the tools so people can hold each other, and they can work together to defend themselves wherever they go. You know, not just in, in, in one work uh, place in particular, wherever they go. And I think Arise has been playing a, a huge um, a role in, in keeping this, uh, you know, this organization together and, and also, uh, you know, to influence in, in, somehow in order, you know, to come and work in, in, in coalition to better off the life of domestic workers in particular. And I think the progress, it has been, amazing since uh, 2016 to, to here, you know, and, and that has been, a, 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 um, a rise has been playing a, a, a real, real crucial role in, in, in bringing this uh, group together, this organization together. 
we had we had we had two comments in the chat that re really build off what you were saying, Margarita. One was from um, Jorge, who said that uh, it's important that workers don't rely entirely on um, on an enforcement office, but get the power to build. That Jorge, I agree with you. But you know what? The other thing is, we found out through our book that nothing scares these employers more quickly than any visit whatsoever from the government. Like, like we, we f one of the things we found out, just as an example, was that a lot of the worker centers, including I'm sure Arise, and uh, would have sessions on how to file an OSHA complaint. Well, none of the, none of the companies want some inspector around. So um, that's one point. And then another person, uh, John uh, mentioned, and I think it's really important. It was super interesting with the rise that they have a, a big Polish um, house cleaning contingent, and um, it it was really it was really interesting. One sort of interesting aspect of the Polish group ver uh, was the messaging has to be slightly different for them because they all escaped from uh, they all came from um, sort of a, a communist based routine where some of the language like worker solidarity was things like that you know that'd be like the common language that worker centers might use that doesn't ring too positively for them they just hear they just that just reminds them of their old government so uh it that was just the, that, i don't know i love that i love those little details because it's so interesting how the worker centers can tailor their messages to the workers not everybody is Latino. Not mm -hmm. everybody is Polish. Not you know, but they're all different, and the the help is given in a tailored fashion, and the power is grown in a fashion that's um, applicable to each group. Now, hey, shut that's, up. <laughs> that's a great topic, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pitch this to to Margarita. So, how does Arise Chicago? Um, um, you know, you have such a diverse membership. How do you manage um, different cultures, the different languages, the different perspectives that people, you know, all have? And you're trying to organize workers on, you know, on issues, um, on, on labor issues. How do you manage that? Well, everything that we, uh, uh, you know, all our literature, everything goes in three languages, you know, English, uh, Polish, and in Spanish. Uh, that's that is the first thing, and secondly, you know, it, it, even though we have different uh, different cultures and different language, definitely, uh, we has been it, it, uh, has been particularly in the last year and a half, you know, trying to find the common ground and trying to get an an, an a cultural understanding, because at the end of the day, the problems are the same, regardless of the language. You know, and, and regardless of the culture, the problems are exactly the same, uh, you know, in the workplace. So we are trying to really uh, reconcile that aspect that, uh, you know, that is what makes us equal. And, and not only that, but, uh, you know, we have parties, for example, with them. We have, uh, we, have, we have events through the year where we have both group together. So we, we try not to separate them constantly, but we have them together. And, and, you know, playing polka, playing, I don't know, salsa, merengue, cumbias, whatever it is, people trying to dance, you know, to uh, our different music and <laughs> trying to know each other, know each other and, and, and trying to find that common ground. You know, uh, the language might be a little bit different and we don't refrain to use terms like, uh, you know, uh, when we are in, in, in the group, you know, this get togetherness in a sense is solidarity, you know, it's solidarity. We are in solidarity with each other. We are in solidarity with our own causes, you know. So the, in, in the union, we used to say, you know, a, a, a injury to one in a, is an injury to all. And that apply wherever we go, you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. And, uh, and people really, if they, you know, they, they are very receptive to it. And, um, you know, it works. Margarita, and we want to come for the food. We want to go for the, if we're the, from the pierogi versus the burrito battle. We want to <laughs> be there. <laughs> Margarita, what, what you're just 
what you were describing and just hearing you talk, it just brings such a smile to my face because that's the kind of joy that I experienced visiting the worker centers. And I think Jane did too. And, you know, there's, there's so much injustice. There's so much lack of respect, workers that are treated as invisible. And yet in my visits to worker centers, all this serious work is being done, but so much is done to create a sense of community with food, sharing of food. There's always little children running around at the meetings. There's music, there's events, um, you know, with, with dancing and singing. And it's like a celebration of what we want for our communities, what we want for our world. And I just, um, it, it just was a privilege to, to learn and write about worker centers. One of, one of the things, you know, it, 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 and Chelly is mentioning, it, this is, you know, it happened on absolutely all our events. Everything go with a translator. We have a, translate, a translation in Spanish and we have translation in Polish. And, and it's, 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 a, it's a great dynamic, you know, it, it, it really creates an understanding. It's like traveling, you know, without leaving the country, really. <laughs> Having this experience when we have, you know, to be, to talk, uh, you know, slow, we, we, we need to be more conscious of, of the others. Uh, but one thing that, that uh, you know, is it, very important, during the pandemic, we were able to really, uh, a lot of things were going on. During the pandemic, we have groups of workers, you know, going out, demanding, say, you know, safety in their workplace. And we have our, our organizers going out, you know, with uh, with petitions, having lines and lines of working, signing petitions saying, you know what, we are going home. We are going to, to, to go and quarantine ourselves until you clean up the workplace, you know, and that was it. And, and, and it was so many of them, you know, doing that, taking care of themselves. We have se uh, 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 several, uh, you know, conversations. We have uh, forums. We have uh, trainings of people, you know, how to deal with the pandemic in the workplace, you know. But also during the pandemic, something happened. You know, we were having these Zoom meetings, you know, all these Zoom meetings, all these Zoom parties. And that. Uh, one of our members say something that it really resonated on me because it was the way they really feel. They say, you know what? Arise has been not just taking care of our workplace, but also uh, of our mental health. You know, we have live music. We have a, a father and, and a daughter playing in their homes, you know, on Zoom, making us dance and sing together. So it's like, uh, you know, even though we were isolated, we were in our house, in quarantine, we were all there and together and alive and doing things, you know, to change and protect our families and protect our community. So it, was it, it has been incredible because we are not completely out of it. So it has been an, a, a tremendous experience. We have a question from John. It says, can the panelists speak about the role of religious communities to the worker center movement? And that's, that's a really good question because it's definitely something we talk about in the book. We have a section of the book called Friends and Allies. And we specifically talk about the role of um, faith communities as well as academics and their um, alliance and their support and, and the role that they have um, with worker centers. Uh, we know that Arise Chicago has a history that began with an interfaith labor and faith group um, and that the worker center evolved out of that. And I'm wondering, um, Marguerite, did you wanna talk a little bit about that? Um, we also, before you do, we, we did also, we do have um, examples in the book about how um, religious leaders and communities support worker centers. Um, there are, there's an example from Bryan, Texas, a small worker center there. Uh, the workers wanted to do a protest 
outside of the poultry processing plant owned by Sanderson Farms. Um, the issue of greatest concern to these workers was their inability to use the restroom when they needed to. Their protest involved uh, workers wearing adult diapers standing on the driveway right outside of the plant. Um, but what was really meaningful and important to the workers was to have a rev friend from the local Episcopal church stand in solidarity. They felt, the workers felt very, um, kind of felt safer and protected. I think safer is the word that one of the workers um, described it, that it was validating and that they felt that, um, that it gave them comfort, that the, their cause was something that leaders in the community, uh, faith leaders in their community recognized is a, a justice issue. Um, and and it, didn't, it didn't hurt that the news coverage you know, when it panned the audience that, that the Reverend from the Episcopal Church was there. But Margarita, Arise Chicago has a, has a, a, a history um, that formed out of the inter, uh, interfaith labor um, group. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Absolutely, you know, a very strong history actually. You know, our organization was created by, you know, a group of, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, religious from uh, different denominations who, you know, what uh, uh, in, in claiming for justice for, uh, you know, workers. So it, it, it comes with our roots. And, uh, and uh, the religion, our religious uh, ally members, you know, we have several of them uh, as a member of our uh, board of directors, but they are in absolutely everything with us. You know, every time we have to bring up a petition, you know, and we need the media, the, you know, the, the, uh, our, uh, the pastors, the, the, um, the priests, the Catholic priests, you know, the, the rabbis are with us walking in, in, you know, into these uh, workplaces over and over and over again. And I think in terms of our community, you know, it's a, both groups, if we are talking about, you know, the Polish community, if we are talking about the, the Latino community are profoundly religious profoundly religious and seeing you know their pastors seeing their their guidance you know supporting them is crucial it's crucial it gave them you know uh they they reassure them they uh they feel empowered they feel supported you know by their pastors and that is uh, you know that that is really amazing for them but the effect on those employers because it's not just you know the workers, but the effect on those employers when 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 we have you know our, our, our you know the pastors when we have the rabbis when we have the priests walking with them, uh, you know and, and, and standing in their doors, the the reaction is completely different, you know. So it's a very powerful it's a very very powerful relationship uh, between you know the 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 religious community and the uh, the workers. Thank you. Thanks so much. One, one, ahead, other thing, one other thing that I like to say about that is it's it's not just a one way street, because when you uh, when you are a religious community and you're looking for ways to express your faith and uh, sometimes it's it's hard to do, like if you're just an average parishioner, you don't know too much, you're trying to figure out how you can be involved in justice and helping others. Then you and your church is involved, and you can become involved, and that's the, some of the things that we also saw in the academic, um, the academic alliance. It's not, it's, it's not, it's not just a one-way street. Like, um, yes, the academics are help ha, help by helping them conduct surveys, uh, giving, and those surveys. Um, like the the real famous one in Chicago, the wage theft one, uh, for, that was like a decade ago. I I think Shelley, maybe you can. Two thousand nine, uh, I think. Two thousand nine, yeah. yeah. So that was a really good, um, you know, a wait the wage theft thing. But it it also helps the academics because they have to continually make sure that their research is relevant. If they want to be published, if they want to gain tenure, they need to also be involved. So what I like about this is that everybody benefits in, in ways that um, are not immediately apparent, that aren't immediately apparent. 
there is a, you know, every year we have labor in the pulpit. That is, a, that is a tradition that Arise Chicago, you know, has been carried for many years during Labor Weekend, Labor Day Weekend. And uh, we go to different, uh, you know, to different uh, churches, again, of different denominations to talk to, you know, to the, the uh, um, to, to talk to the people, to, to, to uh, share, you know, what we do and what they can do. We also, you know, do a lot of uh, trainings, we do workshops, we do a lot of speaking in these uh, congregations. And uh, so it's not just, uh, you know, the, the pastor coming and helping us, it's, 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 a whole, it's a whole relationship that we have with these congregations. And that make it very, um, very unique in a way. Uh, the, the other thing, you know, with the wage step, the case that, that, that you are working probably is the, is the uh, car wash. You know, there that, that was uh, seven employees involved in, in a, in a wage theft that, that it went through a whole process for, for a whole nine years, almost then. Um, it was resolved uh, about a year ago. And it was amazing because, you know, nothing could really bring it on. Three people remain, you know, in the fight. Only three workers remain in the fight. We just, uh, you know, a court order, uh, a judge just uh, uh, award them $326,000 uh, to these three uh, uh, workers in wage theft. So it is possible. It takes a very long time. Nothing should be taking that long, though. You know, uh, things need to be done because that is not right to be fighting for nine years to get the money back to this uh to these uh, workers, but it was done. We, you know, it was a reason really to celebrate them and, uh, you know, getting that retribution and, and have justice uh, served, basically. A long fight. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Latino Union also, uh, which is another worker center in Chicago that we met, they, ha they have an interesting relationship with uh, the faith community as well they have a hiring hall so that if you if you want some work done in your house or you need you know a painter or a housekeeper you can call and uh, latino union will uh, make the introduction but what what they what uh, we learned from them is they also reach out to faith communities and sometimes the congregation members become employers and 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 by the way enlightened uh, employers who have contracts and who can, so they, they're supporting, you know, these, the congregations are supporting people in a real way by giving them, by giving them work, work mm -hmm. done well, work done fairly. And that's another relationship with the faith community. That's a, that's a really great example. Do we have any questions? from our participants. Margarita, I'm wondering if you have a question for Jane and I about the book. When did you hear that there was a book that featured Arai Chicago? Oh, yeah. I've been with the organization for two years. So I, was, I wasn't really there when all the interviews were going, but then, then Shelly said, gave the news, show those beautiful pictures and I say, you know what, these have to be interesting. They're talking about us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to show the book. And because I am joining the call from uh, just down the road from Austin, Texas, uh, we had the really the privilege of being able to use a photograph of um, Lourdes Altavero, who is a member of the Worker Defense Project which started in Austin, Texas. It's a worker center. It also now has offices in Dallas and in Houston. And Lourdes was uh, part of the first class of members from the Dallas office that um, received the OSHA 10 training that they were conducting there in Dallas. And, um, and as Margarita said, we have um, photographs of some of the people who are featured in the in the book and that was another thing that I just think is so special about our book is a lot of times nonfiction books you don't get to see the you don't get to see photos but we have I think 
maybe 10 or 12 photos. And Jane, why don't you um, tell us who the photographer was? Uh, George Bielek, my husband. <laughs> he was very, he was very patient and uh, we went all over the place. We went uh, to upstate New York and it was kind of, it was really interesting to see the common issues between, uh, you know, Polish housekeepers in Chicago and uh, Mexican dairy workers in upstate New York. But there was one thing I wanted to uh, say, make a comment on what Margarita said, which was, um, she was talking about how, you know, the influence um, the leaders and worker centers in other places. One of the people that uh, we interviewed, or Celeste interviewed a lot, uh, Marta Ojeda, um, she was talking about, she was working with someone who was just feeling discouraged. You know, the, it's a hard job organizing, being an organizer. You spend a lot of time. It's, it, it, it seems like the battle is uphill, right, Margarita? How many years with that wage theft and the car wash? And and people burn out, and and some and 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 within the organization, the the workers and the worker leaders encourage each other. And one way that this woman Marta encouraged one of the people she worked with, she said, maybe this worker leader is not going to be leading in the organization in your organization, but wherever that person goes and whatever they do, there'll be a leader somewhere doing something. And you just don't know. And that's a sort of a hidden fruit of this, of this worker center labor that, uh, that we so value. And, and again, it's not the one that you see out front, but it's the one that's there underneath and happening and inspiring. I think that that's what something really special about our book is we capture the voice and the perspective and the experience of really amazing people who are involved in the worker center movement. And, and laced throughout the book are these just beautiful nuggets of messages from the people that we interviewed. And they resonate with everyone. Um, you know, when people, when people read that, you can really pause and say, yeah, you know, through all of my experiences, um, I'm learning something and I'm gonna be taking that with me. And that was the, the message that Marta had for this individual who, who was getting frustrated because they, they spend a lot of time building the leadership of their members and then their members, you know, move on, move away, get different jobs, aren't there anymore, can't be involved and in the frustration that goes along with that. But as Jane said, Marta's message was, you know, that person is not going to, you know, you don't unlearn that. They are going to be an enlightened leader wherever they go. We have another question from John. How has the anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy initiatives of the last four years affected the work of worker centers? Margarita, can you comment on that? Yeah, well, we, uh, we, we have a very hard four years with the past administration, and that is not over, though. I must say, it's not over. <laughs> Uh, it's always, you know, it's, 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 uh, people feel a little bit more, uh, I, I, I will say, relaxed now maybe with the new administration, but it's not over. It's a constant fight, you know, to, trying to get, uh, on, on, unless we really get a path, you know, to, to, to citizenship, uh, a real path to citizenship for all those workers, I don't think our community is going to be at ease ever, you know. Because it's a constant threat, and uh, it, it was a lot. Of this anti-immigrant sentiment, you know, for four years, where people getting hit on the street, you know, people hiding, and you know, it, it was a it was a terrible fear, you know, living fear. But uh, but it's, it's it's up to here because you know people are still getting organized, you know, they, they are still getting into unions, you know, uh, right? Chicago was it has been incubating unions for for. Quite a while. In fact, I was probably the first person in a union who uh, one of the organizers, the organization came to us, you know, our union saying we have this place, these workers want to be organized. And we went out there and we won a union for them, you know, and got a first contract and, 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 and got, uh, you know, the, the organization. But in terms of the immigrants, it, it's a constant fight. It's not that we are going to, you know, be always relaxed. 
There are people who live in fear, but there are a, a lot of people out there willing to fight for their rights. And, and that is what it really, you know, at this point matter. And, and obviously the rhetoric is, uh, you know, the anti-immigrant rhetoric is sick, you know, it's unacceptable, but it's something that, you know, is, is deep in our, in, in, you know, in, in, the, in the, I would say the culture, but it, it's deep in the society. And, uh, and the only thing that we can do is fight, fight to change that perception for you know against the immigrant and the misinformation because there is a lot of misinformation there that people come here to take you know the US citizen uh, jobs that people go and get social benefits which is absolutely not true if you are undocumented you the only right you have is to put your children in in the public schools and uh, drive in the roads that everybody pay taxes if uh, they work they pay taxes like everybody else, and they do not collect, you know, uh, benefits, social security or anything else. So, you know, fight the misinformation and, uh, and, 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 and trying to, you know, not just live our lives, uh, you know, as it goes, but that really, really, you know, find our allies and, 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 and fight for our real immigration reform. Yeah, we definitely heard that in our visits to worker centers. Um, I, in particular, had a super interesting experience when I was in Greaton, California at the worker center, and they actually, the workers, do a skit to help educate each other about what their rights actually are. And so just like Margarita was saying, a really important role is, is educating workers about their rights, whether it's about OSHA or wages or immigration, housing, it's, it's such an important service um, and a, a really important Im information that, that workers need and that people who are immigrants need to know what the laws are because as Margarita said, there's so much misinformation about what you know, the reality is. We people are- People take advantage. I mean, what, I, what was striking is how often people would take advantage. Although there was an interesting uh, sort of labor dynamic in upstate New York, where you had uh, immigrant uh, Mexicans uh, on the farms. Well, on the one hand, it was a great threat to keep them in line to say, well, we'll call you know, immigration on you. But on the other hand, if they did call it anybody to milk the cows. So it was an interesting, um, interesting power dynamic. We are bumping up Sorry. right at eight o'clock. So I want to thank Margarita so much for this great conversation. Um, I just wish that Jane and I could be there with you in person. Um, that, would, that would have just put, been the icing on the cake. And of course, thank my friend and co-author Jane Von Bergen. And of course, thank Arise Chicago, um, the new press and seminary co-op and perhaps Jay, you can put back in the chat box how we can all support some seminary co-op by purchasing the book on the job, the untold story of worker centers and the new fight for wages, dignity and health. Purchase it from seminary, seminary co-op books. And thank you for coming and, and listening to this, everybody who's here. Definitely really, really appreciate it. Uh, we appreciate anybody that reads our book, but I want to say I think you'll also enjoy the book. It's it's not that it's it's not it's not difficult reading. It has a good mix of stories, and I don't know. I'm proud of it, <laughs> and proud of Celeste. She's so awesome. Thank you, Jane.